This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. Is the American economy already bankrupt? Professor Larry Kotlikoff is one of North America's most renowned economists, and he suggests that it is and was already before the global financial crisis. He was one of the first to forecast the GFC in his book, The Coming Generational Storm, in 2004. There he argued that the economic future will be bleak for the United States without tax, health care and social security reform. In his latest book, Jimmy Stewart is Dead, he offers a solution to future financial crises called limited purpose banking. Professor Larry Kotlikoff is a William Warren Fairfield professor at Boston University, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a fellow of the US Econometric Society. So Larry, going back to 2004, at the time you were talking that there may actually be some sort of financial crisis, some sort of financial meltdown in the United States. So is it fair to say that you forecast the global financial crisis? Well, I, I was thinking more about the fiscal problems leading to a collapse in the U.S. bond market, which I think is still going to come. I wasn't really thinking that uh, we had an entire financial industry systematically engaging in fraud through the production of securities that you know have been called toxic assets at this point. So uh, that certainly compounded our fiscal problems. In the U.S., we have a country that's uh, essentially bankrupt and people don't seem to understand exactly how bad the fiscal picture is because they look at the official debt numbers when the unofficial obligations to pay for pension benefits and health care benefits to 78 million baby boomers are just massive and will make our official debt explode relative to GDP. And that is starting to dawn on the American public. And that's why you have this big fight uh, in the U.S. between the Republicans and the Democrats over how to fix things. So we have to fix our tax system. We have to fix our uh, pension system. We have to fix our financial system. And on the health care side, you can achieve the solution pretty easily by saying, look, we're going to get rid of the employer-based health care. We're going to get rid of our health care system for the elderly, which we call Medicare. We're going to get rid of Medicaid, which is our health insurance for the very poor. We're going to start from scratch and give everybody a basic plan. The government is going to pay everybody to have a basic plan. And... Uh, they're going to do it in the form of giving everybody a voucher to go buy a basic plan from a health insurance company. And the voucher is going to have a different number on it depending on your pre-existing condition. So if you're sick, you're going to have a big voucher. If you're healthy, you'll have a small voucher. And if you look at the president's new Obamacare proposal, which is to deal with the uninsured, I like to call it Obamacare because I think he does care. Uh, and he should care because we have 50 million uninsured people. Everybody needs to have a health insurance, no question about it. There's a consensus. So the president put in place a system for the, uh, for the uninsured, which is very similar to what I just proposed. Uh, and so we're having big arguments in the U.S. over language. The Republicans use one set of words. The Democrats use another set of words. The Democrats start labeling, uh, start, start saying, well, you pri you're privatizing Healthcare. Well, the president's own health exchange proposal has people choosing a health plan, and those health plans are being provided by insurance companies. That's a privatized system. So we have a bunch of uh, children arguing, well, the house is burning down. This is Nero fiddling as Rome burns. You almost seem to be implying then that uh, current ways of measuring how well the economy are doing just aren't good enough because uh, you're saying that the, the economy is bankrupt. Well, at the same point, if you look at the, the books, if you like, and you got the published accounts from the US, and they go, it's not great, but they can kind of muddle through. The books are really um, fraudulent accounting. Our accounting at the government level is worse than Enron accounting. You see, when the government, when a government, whether it's our government or any government, takes in money from the public, it has the leeway or the option to call that borrowing or call it taxes. And money it hands out, it has the option of calling that a transfer payment or 
return on principal plus interest on some prior borrowing. So the very measurement of debt is not is up for grabs. Uh, borrowing is a matter of the government's choice of language. And uh, how you label it will determine how much of your fiscal gap, the difference between all the spending and present value and all the taxes, that's the true $200 trillion number that we want to look at here, how much of that fiscal gap shows up as official debt versus how much it shows up in as unofficial debt obligations, in our case, to pay for health care and Social Security benefits and also defense spending. We have impl implicit debts, unofficial debts, and official debts. The fiscal gap combines all these debts, and how much shows up in one way or the other is a matter of our choice of words. There's nothing economic that says whether I should take somebody's contributions for retirement and call that a tax or whether I should call it a borrowing and say that the benefits in retirement correspond to return of principal plus interest on that borrowing. So no economic theory will tell you whether to use one set of words or another. It won't change what the equations are saying. The equations are the equations, and if it's a well-conceived model, it's going to tell you a story about the economy, how it moves through time. And uh, what's going on in our country for decades now is that We've used words to disguise what we're doing, to keep the official debt really small. The unofficial debt's gotten massive. And what we've really been doing is taking huge resources from young people and giving them to old people. We've been running this massive Ponzi scheme for decades, six decades now, starting really with Eisenhower, uh, who doubled the size of the Social Security system. And Republican and Democratic presidents, doesn't matter who, they're taking from young and giving to the old. And they do it with words that don't show big official debts, but accumulate huge implicit unofficial debts. And now we're at the end of this chain letter, the end of this Ponzi scheme, where we don't have uh, enough young people coming along, earning enough money to pay for all these promises that have been made. So that's what's happened here. This has been um, a Ponzi scheme that would have made Madoff very, very proud. We can have a rational health care system. It wouldn't look all that much different from the Australian or the Dutch or the German systems, other countries. Uh, but we're not doing that. We're having fights there in Washington. So I do expect there to be a, a massive collapse of the U.S. Uh, bond market. I expect interest rates to skyrocket, and I expect to, have, uh, to see huge financial uh, fallout from all this. For, can you put a time scale on this? Well, what, what sort of forecast, if you polish up your crystal ball, what, what can you well, say? Well, I think it could happen very soon. I think it could happen in the next few months, to tell you the truth. I, you know, this is going to be on tape, and five years from now I'll come back, and you'll say, well, here's what you said, and it never happened. And, of course, it really depends on a lot of people's sense that, that uh, the, end is, the game is up. So it's really bankruptcy is in the eyes of the creditor, so if you have enough creditors saying, hey, we don't trust the U.S. government to repay, then you can have everybody jumping on that bandwagon and you can have the market collapse, the bond market for the U.S. Treasury bonds collapse. Now, Bill Gross, who runs the, the largest mutual fund in the world for PIMCO, has just uh, said he's not going to hold any long-term or even medium-term U.S. government bonds because the concern is the government's going to print money to try and pay these bills. And we have been printing money like crazy since 2008. We've expanded the basic money supply by a factor of four. By the end of this year, we'll have quadrupled the basic money supply. The banks are now being bribed not to lend out this money, They're being bribed by the Federal Reserve by paying, they're paying interest on the excess reserves the banks are holding. But if this extra money that the government, that the Fed has printed gets into the bloodstream, if that is lent out, we could have a quadrupling of prices just based on what we've already seen. You know, if inflation takes off, uh, interest rates will take off, bond markets will crash. So Bill Gross has just pulled out of the market. Maybe George Soros will start selling Treasury bonds short or whatever. Um, if enough big players start doing this, things will happen. The uh, Standard & Poor's just put out a warning, another warning, I think, on the U.S. fiscal situation. I think it's desperately grave. I think it could happen very, very quickly. If everybody believes the government can't pay its bills and they think, oh, they're going to start printing money, then they're going to turn money into a hot potato. And so even with the same supply of money, if it starts circulating more rapidly, because I don't want to hold money because I think prices are going to go up, 
So I start moving it around. I try and unload it very quickly. Then that effectively ends up being like more money. It's called the velocity of money rising. And that by itself can lead to inflation, if not hyperinflation. We have seen in the great hyperinflations that the growth rate of prices is much greater than the growth rate of the money supply because money starts circulating much more rapidly. So if people start to expect inflation, they will make it happen. Uh, and the bond market will crash. Interest rates will rise. The first thing Bernanke will have to do is print money to try and lower interest rates. So exactly what people fear happening will happen. And so the whole thing can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. But we've seen collapses in other bond markets overseas. I'm thinking of Argentina, for example, and uh, Greece now. I mean, a Greek bond is very different to a U.S. Treasury bond. Surely U.S. Treasury bonds are the gold standard. P people really believe in those. What would happen? Would the U.S. economy be able to recover and would treat this as a sort of temporary blip? Or would a meltdown in U.S. Treasury bonds then leave a financial wasteland that would take decades to recover from? The problem is that our fiscal situation is worse than Greece but the bond market doesn't really understand that. Their fiscal gap is about 11 times their GDP. Ours is about 14 times our GDP. So if you look at the unofficial debts, we're in worse shape than Greece. The official debts, it looks like we're in better shape. But even on an official debt basis, in a decade, we're gonna be at the debt to GDP ratio of Greece. Uh, so we're in a trajectory to have official debt far exceed the uh, as a share of GDP far exceed the, the Greek value over you know, 15, 20 years. Now, being optimistic and uh, looking at ways to actually avert this coming crisis, I know in your latest book called Jimmy Stewart is Dead, you, you've been looking at these issues and ways possibly to try and avoid them. Is there a way of getting around them? I'm thinking of things like limited purpose banking. C can you explain that? Well, yeah, the, at the end of the book, I talked about how to fix the health care system, the social security system, that's the that's our government pension system, and uh, also the tax system. And those are very simple solutions for those problems. But we also have this financial system, which is fundamentally uh, fragile because it is subject to fraud. You don't have any transparency coming from Wall Street. Every major bank an insurance company is saying, you can't see what I'm doing with your money because I have the Midas touch. I can make a gold mine from you for, for you. Give me your money. I can't tell you what I'm doing with it. And I'm just going to, just trust me, I'm going to make a mint. And then what we've seen is that they invest in uh, fraudulent securities or, um, or in the case of Madoff, just pocket the money. Trust me, banking has to be transformed to show me banking. We have to have full transparency so that we don't see runs on financial institutions that are, that are trust runs, where people are concerned about fraud, or fraud runs is another term for it. That's what we saw in 2008. They ran on, on Bear Stearns because nobody could trust the person at the top, who is Jimmy Kane, who was running Bear Stearns. This is a guy who dropped out of college who is purported to have been smoking dope, who is playing bridge while his two big hedge funds collapsed. And he's supposed to understand and manage the risk of a portfolio that's the size of a New York uh, telephone book, all the details. Well, it became clear that uh, to a large number of people that maybe they couldn't actually trust Jimmy Kane. And then everybody ran because everybody thought maybe other people don't trust him. All the trust ends up being reposed in the people at the very top of these institutions who are the only ones who actually have the ability to find out what their institutions are doing. The individual traders in those companies don't even have access to all the positions. So this trust me banking system that we have is extremely fragile because all the trust resides in the very top person, whether it's Dick Fold from Lehman Brothers or Jimmy Kane or... <clears throat> the head of a uh, city group, whatever. And that makes the system open to runs. And what we need to do then is to have transparency where all the positions are made available to the investors on the web in real time. So we have to give up proprietary information and make it clear what people are investing in. So that's one key feature of limited purpose banking. So the way it works is there's gonna be a federal financial authority that would um, fully disclose 
the securities that the financial intermediaries are holding. Now, the financial intermediaries would be changed from what we now have are banks and insurance companies. They would all be mutual fund companies, holding companies. Now, a mutual fund holding company is engaged in issuing mutual funds, marketing mutual funds. A mutual fund itself, it's a bank that doesn't borrow. It's a non-leveraged bank. It takes in money on an equity basis. It sells shares. The investors hand it the money, and then the mutual fund buys the securities that it says it's investing in. Like, you have, we have in the U.S. 8,000 mutual funds, and some invest in treasury bonds, some invest in stocks, some invest in foreign stocks, Is it, you know, some invest in mortgages. So let's take all the banks and insurance companies and say, look, you guys can no longer operate the way you are. You have to operate in just one way as a mutual fund, and therefore you have to take money in on a non-leveraged basis, no borrowing, just sell mutual funds. The mutual funds then will invest. And guess what? The mutual funds themselves can never go broke because there's no borrowing. There's no debt. So the financial intermediaries can never go broke. The holding company, the mutual fund holding company that has maybe 50 mutual funds that it's marketing, uh, it can't go broke either because its individual components can't go broke. So you have a financial system that can never collapse. If one mutual fund if they invest in things that lose all their value, it doesn't affect any other mutual fund. There's natural firewalls here. Whereas under the current system, we have streams of gasoline connecting the different financial institutions. If one lights up, it just spreads from one to the next. So the whole thing can burn down. So we need a financial system that is safe. We particularly need a financial system that is safe uh, in the context of a fiscal policy that's completely unsafe. Because what happens tomorrow if there is a collapse in the U.S. bond market, what's going to happen? Interest rates are going to shoot up. Uh, the Fed is going to print more money. People are going to get nervous about inflation. And if I've got assets in a bank, I'm going to want to go and get that money out and, get, and buy something real before prices go up. So you could have runs on the banks in the U.S. because of a fear of inflation. And then... We have a fiscal crisis and a financial crisis occurring at the same time. So the idea is let's use limited purpose banking to keep the financial system f safe and then let's reform fundamentally our fiscal institutions. But right now, the entire country's economy uh, lies under a, a kind of a sword of Damocles. At any moment, the whole thing can, can fall apart. What we saw in 2008, we barely averted a complete financial meltdown. And when you have a financial system where you've made promises you can't keep and everybody can then run, well, it can have a meltdown. And deposit insurance is not going to keep that from happening because the government is guaranteeing to pay you back your dollars, not your purchasing power. So if inflation takes off and everybody were to run on the banks in the U.S. today, the Fed says, don't worry, we can, we're going to pay you back your money. They say, we don't want our money. We want our purchasing power. We want to be able to get our money and buy something real before it's worthless. So they run and they start withdrawing money from the banks. Well, the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Company, comes in and has to print literally $6 trillion bucks to cover these withdrawals. And then they have to print another $3 trillion to cover the withdrawals from the money market accounts that would occur right away. And then the life insurance companies have about $3 trillion in cash surrender value policies. So you could have the printing overnight of about $12 trillion by the Federal Reserve. So Wall Street was engaged in making promises it couldn't keep in, in selling fraudulent promises. The government comes in, in our country, and says, don't worry, public. Wall Street has made these fraudulent promises, but we're going to guarantee them. Now, that itself is a fraudulent promise because they can't guarantee, in real terms, $12 trillion. That's almost the size of our GDP. So Uncle Sam has made promises it can't keep in real terms. It's conveyed these promises in a way that people think they're real. Now, the financial system is trying to connect savers and, and investors and lenders and borrowers, and that's a very vital function uh, that they're playing. You don't want this vital... It's like a highway. They're intermediaries. You wouldn't want a high, highways to break down. In the beginning of my uh, book, Jimmy Stewart is Dead, I talk about 
gas station owners, what if they were all to uh, sell GOTs, uh, which are um, gas options for drivers? So all the gas station owners sell these options and say, look, if the price of gasoline goes up above a certain price, you can cash in your option and buy gas at $4 a gallon. Well, what happens if the price of gas actually goes up to $8 a gallon? And the gas station owners have to deliver gas at $4 a gallon. And they all go broke. And they all leave their gas station with the keys. Now, these gas stations are critical intermediaries between drivers and refineries. They're intermediating that business. If they walk away from their pumps with their keys, nobody can drive in the country. There's no gas. So if they were to do this, the government would surely come in and say, guess what, gas station owners? If you want to go gamble or do, engage in some bet about the price of gas, do that in your own house, on your own time, with your own money, but not with your gas station business. You're not allowed to do that as part of a gas station. Your job as a gas station is just to buy and sell gas. It's not to gamble. And that would ensure that the gas stations would never shut down. That's what we have to do with the, with the uh, financial system because they are also intermediaries. That's their job. They're not here to gamble with our money and take the upside and leave the downside to the public to pay in the form of taxes. And ultimately, the public can't really cover it. Professor Larry Kotlikoff, thank you very much. My pleasure. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. 